is America with Rich Valdez, powered by PolitiWeek.com. And Rich Valdez is with us, former Christie administration official. You worked for Chris Christie, you've been in politics, done a lot of public service stuff. Rich Valdez, columnist now with the Washington Times. This is America. Kanye said what? Then, Kavanaugh will be voted and confirmed to the Supreme Court. And why is anybody a conservative anyway? This is America with your host, Rich Valdez. What a generous introduction. Thank you so much to uh, former um, sound guy on the Howard Stern Show. He's a fantastic producer and expert in the area of imaging, Mr. Chris Libertini, for putting together that wonderful introduction. And of course, Today's program is produced by none other than executive producer Rich Cementa, my good friend, Mr. Producer, the original Mr. Producer, so I get to call him Mr. Producer because he is Mr. Producer, as dubbed so by the great one. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining This Is America. I would love to hear your comments. Uh, If you're able to listen to the live stream of this on Instagram or on Facebook, Please drop a comment. If you're listening to the podcast version, then by all means, please uh, subscribe and uh, share it with your friends. And of course, tweet at me uh, at Rich Valdez. That's R-I-C-H-V-A-L-D-E-S and hashtag This Is America. Now, a lot of people ask me, why am I a conservative to begin with? After all, I was uh, born in Brooklyn, New York, um, 40 years old, and my parents are from Puerto Rico. So. How does that happen? Well, I mean, I think the first reason is I love America. I love what this country stands for. I love what this country has provided for me. And I believe that our rights in this country come from God and not from the government. So you put all of that together and you think, hmm, 16 years old, I started a barbershop. I didn't like to pay taxes. Who wants to give? When you're 16 years old and you you start a barbershop out of your house, you start making money. The last thing you want to do is pay taxes and share what your your hard-earned dollars with the federal government. So, I mean, I, I had an aversion to paying taxes um, since I was a kid. I think, you know, we've got to pay what we've got to pay. Everybody's got to pay their fair share and we got to follow the law. But I by no means am a fan of big government or doing more than I need to do when it comes to paying my taxes. Part of what makes America great is the fact that if you provide an excellent service, or a service that's mediocre, whatever the quality of the service is, if there's a demand for that service, if people want what you've got, they're willing to pay for it. And as long as the government stays out of your way, you're good. So as a young man owning a barbershop, this was golden for me. There's no way I could not gravitate naturally towards capitalism. And besides capitalism, one of the things that I think is really important is that we have this remarkable document called the Constitution. And I uh, took out my stethoscope and time of death, 1789. This thing was never alive. It's not a living and breathing document. It's a contract. It's a legal document. So when, when you hear that nonsense, discard it because you don't want the Constitution to change. You don't want your rights and liberties that are guaranteed through this document to be fluid. You want what's there to withstand the test of time so that we have something that we can rely on. Without that, we're lost. And when it comes to being lost, I mean, we will have lost our way in America. So in a nutshell, I think a healthy economy is good for America. I think a solid constitution is good for America. I think civil war, bad for America. Economic collapse, bad for America. Do we need to push back? Yes. How do we do it? through the media, through the university, through taking back the institutions that have been taken away from us by those who believe different. All that and more coming up now. This is America. All right, so we're talking Kanye West on this past weekend's uh, Saturday Night Live. Kanye had a lot of interesting things to say, and I really think it's interesting because I think a lot of this went over a lot of people's heads, so I want to play the audio, but uh, I want to just read you a transcript really quick of what Kanye was talking about because I think he gets at the real essence of independent thought and free thinking. So he says, in the first uh, cut that we're going to play, we have the audio, it says, uh, 
Actually, blacks weren't always Democrats. It's like a plan they did to take fathers out of the home and promote welfare. Does anybody know about that? That's the Democratic plan. Now, you can have a situation where we need to have a dialogue, not a diatribe. Because if you want something to change, it's not going to change by saying, F that person. So try love. You see, now they're laughing at me. You heard them? They scream at me. They bully me. They bullied me backstage. They said you can't go out there with that hat. And by that hat, he's talking about his red Make America Great Again hat. And then they say I'm in a sunken place. You want to see a sunken place? Then listen, I'm going to put my Superman cape on and he puts on his red uh, Make America Great Again hat because you can't tell me what to do. Actually, blacks weren't always Democrats. You know, it's like the plan they did uh, to take the fathers out of the home and promote welfare. Does anybody know about that? That's a Democratic plan. Now, you got a situation where we need to have a dialogue and have a diatribe. Because if you want something to change, it's not going to change by saying, fuck that person. Try love. You see, they laughing at me. You heard them, they scream at me. They bully me. They bullied me backstage. They said, don't go out there with that hat on. They bullied me backstage. They bullied me. And then they say, I'm in a sunken place. You want to see the sunken place? Okay. I'm going to listen to y'all now. I'm going to put my Superman cape on. You can't tell me what to do. Now, what's interesting is, like Trump, Kanye uses the crowd, he uses uh, bombast, if you will, to really get people uh, stirred up when he makes these types of comments, but he is really breaking it down. He he is a lot more, there's a lot more depth to these comments than him just saying, oh, I don't like this team or I don't like that side, because he's breaking it down. He's looking at the history and showing that what's really attacking America today, one of the biggest problems we have that affects everything from from people's mental health to everything else like your social status and how much money you make is the institution of the family and the degradation of that family. And there's enough research there. I don't have to sit here and promote family values. Um, It's that's evident and it's abundant and it's available. But he keeps going and he even um, indicts the media. And that's a topic that I love to talk about because I work in the world of media And uh, I think that there's, um, on both sides of the aisle, there's definitely uh, a lot of bias on both sides. And that's okay if there's bias. I just think you have to uh, be upfront about your bias. So if we uh, move into cut two, you're going to hear him talking a little bit about the media and his thoughts on that. Follow your heart and stop following your mind. That's how we're controlled. That's how we're programmed. If you want the world to move forward, try love. Thank y'all for giving me this platform. I know some of y'all don't agree, but y'all be going at that man neck to mock, and I don't think it's actually that helpful. I think the universe has balance. So right there, I just wanted to pause it really fast because he says, y'all be going at that man neck a lot. And I think that's a really important statement because he's he's putting it out there that he is observing too many people are going after Trump and it's not helping anything. It's not adding to the conversation. Kind of circling back to what he said originally, he said, um, you want to solve things, you can't say that by saying, F this person, try love. Now, of course, yeah, he sounds a little flowery and a little hippie-ish uh, with this love talk, but I think he's onto something. Kanye is, is breaking it down right now, saying that these people, uh, the left and the critics of, of the president, are going at his neck a lot. And when he says, y'all be going at that man's neck a lot, and it's not helpful, I think it's speaking volumes. He then goes into why people are doing it, and it's because, you know, there's an art to influencing, and the media uses this art of influencing to get at people. So let's listen to the rest of this cut. I think the universe has balance. 90% of news are liberal. 90% of TV, LA, New York, writers, rappers, musicians. So it's easy to make it seem like it's so, so, so one-sided. And uh, I am kind of free. I thought this country said I could be me. So after Kanye, of course, uh, says that he loves himself and the crowd says they love him, um, you know, he, he started off saying 90% of the media is liberal. And again, it, 
we can debate how what the percentage is, but the reality is most of the mainstream media, the media that we consume every day, is rather one-sided. Yeah, there's the world of talk radio and there's Fox News, but it's minimal. And I think what Kanye is really going after here is saying we have to be independent thinkers. We have to be free thinkers. There's another side to the story. And, of course, Kanye became, um, you know, a little bit of a lightning rod for, for criticism six months ago when he received a autographed uh, MAGA hat from the president and put it on Twitter and he got beat up for that. But I think... Uh, he got a little bit more criticism as of late when he made comments about abolishing the 13th Amendment. So he recently took to TMZ to talk about, you know, to clarify his position on what his thoughts on the 13th Amendment were. And he really breaks it down. And this is a clip I really want to break down with you guys. So take a listen. Abolish was the wrong language. I misspoke by saying abolish. Amend is the right language. And was awesome i don't say dope because it's uh there's power in words so lovely what's beautiful about our constitution is we can amend it right so now kanye breaks down he says you know what's lovely what's beautiful about our constitution is that we can amend it and he's clarifying that he didn't mean abolish the 13th amendment he meant amend and he's going to go into that but i think what's important here is that he's acknowledging the constitution i think today too few people um a, realize that the Constitution is something that actually guides the way our country is governed and know what's in it. I think we need, you don't know what your rights are if you don't know what's in the Constitution. And the bigger argument for me is, where do these rights come from? And that's the real big question. And we're going to jump into that a little bit later, but let's continue listening to Kanye. In 1865, the 13th Amendment stated that no man is destined to slavery or involuntary servitude unless convicted of a crime. This translates to, in order to make a freed man a slave, all you have to do is convict them of a crime. I, I stand on the majority of people that are in prison are there due to a reaction to a situation that they're in, a reaction to not having understanding of how to create industry. So a reaction to not to not knowing how to create industry. The majority of people that are in prison are there as a reaction, and it's a reaction of not knowing how to create industry. Fascinating. He's saying that people, their lack of economic resources, not knowing how to create industry, not knowing how to start a business, um, is what is leading to poverty, which is leading to mass incarceration. I could not agree more. I think that people are in jail. I think people are poor. All of it's because of education. The the more education you have, the more opportunity you have, and obviously the more wealth that you can create. But um, I cut Kanye short, and I, w I want him to go into it. But I really wanted to to make this this stand out because Kanye is making a really impassioned plea for capitalism specifically through entrepreneurship because their dad didn't have a business so they didn't know how to make money or not having access to currently legalized forms of industry also being brainwashed to you know feel like they're taking a side red or blue a gang side of this this is my block a block that they don't even own taking a side and then that gets promoted in the music and then the music is not even owned by the people that are saying these things. Okay, before he gets into his next point, because he, he, he's making a lot of really significant points, in my opinion. Right, so he says now that, that, that before you know it, the message goes into their music, and it's music they don't even own. This is, I mean, if Kanye is not peeling back the layers of true conservatism and the Constitution, where it, it talks about private property rights, this is what he's talking about. He's saying that they have a message that they're using their free speech, but they don't even own it. And this is, you know, intellectual property, private property rights is really what he's getting at here. And, and this is, to me, the crux of how you succeed in, in America. This is understanding how America works and using it to your benefit so that you can create wealth. And then the next thing you know, you get all these um, you get people in jail. You have over two million. There should be a group of super knowledgeable people that have, uh, that come from all cultures that then make the amendments on our constitution. I didn't say modern, I didn't say new, because that, that notes a specific time, when time is used to control us and control our energy. So there needs to be people who look like the people who, be, who are being spoke about. Okay, so Kanye says a lot of things here. First, he, uh, he mentioned um, gangs, and he said, okay, so 
they feel like they have to pick a side, the red side or the blue side. Now here, this is the essence of Marxism, right? So Car- the German philosopher Karl Marx, who is the, uh, the father of, of communism as we know it in the Western Hemisphere, uh, who is the author of the Communist Manifesto, this is uh, the, the essence of this at its very, very core is, is separating people into groups. Uh, it's based on tribalism. Um, and this tribalism is based on income, right? So Marx uses classism, uh, the, the lower income class, the middle income class, and the upper income class uh, to, in effect, wage class warfare, warfare against people. And this is how Kanye describes picking between the left and the right, or the red gang and the blue gang, or the bloods and the crips. It's this tribalism, it's this separation of people that ultimately is what puts us into uh, the situation that we're in. For example, the progressive political movement has its roots in Karl Marx's communist theory, which of course, like I said, is committed to grouping people via politics as the end goal of all thought. His predecessor, Hegel, had a goal to reduce reality to absolute idealism. So if that's the philosophy that guides us and we separate people based on materialism through politics, which is Marx's idea, and reduce reality to ideology, which is Hegel's idea, then voila, you have progressive Democrats that will use the government to fix everything, everything under the sun to make this a perfect world. This means there's no personal initiative, there's no personal responsibility, and the government is the source of all power and authority. So it's okay to use the FBI to derail Donald Trump's campaign, or look the other way on Hillary Clinton's emails, or exploit like-minded supporters, um, you know, like Dr. Ford, and use her misfortune to obstruct the president's Supreme Court nominee, because the end justifies the means. At the end of the day, it's idealism that is our reality. And we, we get to that by separating people into groups. And that's not me making that up. That's, that's the essence of Marxism and Hegelian thought as it applies today to leftist progressive philosophy, if you will. And this is why uh, I would posit it's not going to end. People are always going to disagree. But when you have more people on one side than the other that uh, agree... This is where you get this, this group think that is, is dangerous. And I think everybody, whether you're on the left or you're on the right or you're in the middle, you should always question. Intellectual inquiry, I think, is key to everything. That's how you break it down. That's how you are able to analyze things. All right, so now we're going to switch gears into the Civil War. And by Civil War, uh, you've got people on the left, you've got people on the right. People everywhere are like, this country is destroyed, this country's... Uh, it's broken. It's divided. We've never seen it so divided. Uh, and and truth be told, th- there's been a lot of division. I mean, my personal opinion has been that Donald Trump was able to win the presidency because he used Barack Obama's playbook. Barack Obama figured out that he could play to a certain base. And the base that he played to were African-American voters that had not come out and voted before. He figured out, if I create new voters, I can win an election. They did the same thing. They just appealed to different sides of the political spectrum and different races, different demographics, different age groups, different educational backgrounds. But at at the end of the day, it was a very, very similar um, political strategy to get to these people. And they both were able to mobilize people to get them over the top and get them into the White House. So I don't think that... You know, we have a civil war on our hands. I don't think that um, radical right wingers, like many people like to say, are going to go out and arm themselves with an AR-15 and go ahead and go buck wild. I don't think that's going to be the case. This is America. So to circle back about my thoughts on civil war, because I get this a lot. There's people from every side of the spectrum that are like, hey. We're, we're, we're fed up. We can't take anymore. This is it. And, you know, you've got the left saying, resist, resist, resist. And you've got the right saying, we can't take it anymore. We can't take it anymore. And, and, and I have the opportunity pretty regularly to speak with a lot of people across America. And it, 
it really, I'm taken aback by some of the things I hear. And it's frustration. I know it's driven by frustration, but they say to me, do you think people are just going to lose it? Do you think they're just going to arm themselves and just go for it? You know, are, are gun loving Americans going to go out and start a civil war with the anti fascists the Antifa people? And, and I, my thought to that is really no. I mean, sure, there will be, you know, protests and marches and, you know, unfortunate incidents like what we saw in Charlottesville and things that happen on a regular basis in, in, in Portland. But by and large, I don't think lovers of America that honor the Constitution and honor the Pledge of Allegiance that very clearly says one nation under God, indivisible. I mean, indivisible means we are not to be divided. So true patriots, uh, excuse me, true patriots that honor this pledge, these thoughts aren't going to cross their mind. And to be honest with you, whenever I hear talk about this new civil war, I wonder, how would it work, theoretically? Who's going to shoot whom? Will constitutional conservatives go after these Antifa thugs, or will it be climate change loving progressives that have uh, uh, a skirmish? I can't put two and two together with when it comes to the civil war. I realize that there are opposing viewpoints and there's a lot of polarization, but we just have not reached that point. Now, quite frankly, when it comes to philosophy, are we looking at a civil war? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, we are arguing amongst ourselves philosophically. And are there people that believe in a philosophy that's good for America? And are there people that believe in a philosophy that's bad for America? In my opinion, in my best estimation, yes, absolutely again. But whenever I hear this stuff, I, I always think to myself, uh, is the left going to try and overthrow the White House by force? It's clear that with the Russia uh, gate or spy gate, um, they tried to do it through subterfuge and through corruption. But is some is George Soros going to show up in front of the White House in a tank? No, that's not going to happen. So, I mean, I think all too often uh, hyperbole takes a hold of things and we forget that we have police. We forget that we have military. We forget that we are a nation of laws and police and military officers that are sworn to uphold the United States Constitution. So, unless George Soros and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama are going to become the generals of this new confederacy, if you will, that's going to overthrow Trump and um, secede from the United States, I really doubt we're going to have a physical civil war. You know, back in 1860, we had neighboring states that were like-minded, so a North versus South scenario was possible. But today, our least armed states are our most liberal states. So unless Jerry Brown is going to make California its own country and try to secede, uh, it, it's not going to happen. Now, can the police from California, the state police and the National Guard, resist and take on the rest of the United States military? I don't think so. So that's a big no from me. Now, whether it's Mario Cuomo in New York or Rahm Emanuel, uh, I don't think they could do it either. I mean, maybe these states could choose to secede and join Canada. But Canada has way too much to lose to get involved in any of this type of nonsense. So really, these are, these are asinine um, possibilities, in my opinion. You know, without a genuine military leader, a general like Robert E. Lee that would lead the charge to defend slavery, for example, uh, because they wanted free labor for plantations, I just can't see this happening. This is just a, a battle of ideas. It's a battle for the hearts and minds of future generations. So the final word here is we need to keep lending reason and voice to the truth because future generations are watching and truth and logic have lost the battle for the hearts and minds of the last few generations. We've got a lot of work to do to teach future generations about reason, about logic, and about our great nation. And that's all I've got for today. I am Rich Valdez, and this is America.